All right. Well, it's uh, it's eleven thirty two coming up on thirty three <laughs> on my watch. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to day three of the uh, friends and partners in aviation weather special aviation federal aviation weather technical exchange meeting, which is a mouthful and a half, especially if you haven't had quite enough coffee yet. Uh, I. I um, I must say days one and two have, at least from my perspective, um, not disappointed. And um, and I, looking at today's agenda, uh, the lineup of, of speakers and topics, uh, it seems to me that that uh, day three will not um, will not uh, disappoint either. Um, uh, day three will be led by Mr. Jeff Weinrich. Um, and Jeff is, if I can get to the right page here, uh, he uh, is, supports the National Weather Service Office of Science and Technology Integration uh, and works for the Science and Technology Corporation. Uh, before we hand it off to Jeff, however, I in turn am going to hand it off to the, 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 the much more sophisticated and erudite uh, Matthias Steiner, who will uh, go over our uh, administrative uh, items, and then uh, after he's done, we'll give the ball to Jeff and we'll let him start running. Matthias? Well, thank you for getting us started here, Matt, and can you take the next slide, please? Uh, welcome from my side as well, here for the third day of this year's fall FPA meeting. And as you can see today, we will talk about commercial space and uh, multi-use weather and future weather. So it's a, quite an interesting mix of aspects that we will be discussing today. Uh, the planning meeting will be then on October 20. That is kind of a look beyond uh, this meeting, but looking ahead of topics that we may be discussing in the spring meeting or next fall meeting uh, a year from now. So if you're interested in helping shape the future of FPA meetings, please join us on the planning meeting. will be the same time frame, 11.30 a.m., to about 4 p.m. Eastern uh, on that day. Uh, information is also on the FPA website where you could submit potential topics that you may want to have considered for future discussions. In terms of today's meeting, please mute your microphones if you are not talking. That really helps minimizing background noise. And we're using the chat room as in the past couple of days where you can submit questions and comments. And David Strand is monitoring the chat room and he will assist Jeff with uh, the discussion led that way. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Jeff to take it from here. Thank you. Thank you and uh, welcome everyone. Um, we have an uh, exciting uh, day planned. Um, so our first session will be weather support to commercial space. Um, how will the boom in commercial space affect aviation weather operations? What are the requirements? What are the roles will government agencies play in weather support for these up? Uh, we'll be talking about strategic payloads, orbital flights, launch and reentry, interplanetary travel. Our first uh, speaker, um, and so our, our format, if you haven't uh, um, joined us um, this week, will be uh, a short um, uh, presentation by each of the um, uh, panelists. Um, and then um, we'll get into discussion modes with the panel, so we're not going to be uh, death by PowerPoint today. Just a lot of uh, engaging discussion. Um, so our first uh, um, Panelist is Carl Garman, and he is an aerospace engineer at the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation. He collaborates collaboratively and assists the office to encourage, to facilitate, and promote commercial space launches and reentries by the private sector, with particular emphasis on ensuring public safety. Carl received his MS in aerospace engineering and PhD 
in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences from Purdue University. At Purdue, he also um, was a research pilot for the NSF-funded Airborne Laboratory for Atmospheric Research, ALAR. He also earned an MA in National Security and Strategic Studies uh, from the U.S. War College. He is an Associate Fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, AIAA, and is the former chair of its Flight Testing Technical Committee. He is the technical chair for AIAA's Ascend 2021 Space Conference taking place this November. Uh, welcome, Carl. Greetings, Jeff. Greetings, everybody. Um, cue up the slides. Uh, are you driving or do you prefer that I just uh, uh, like drive from my computer? Uh, what, whatever you prefer. If it's easier for you, you can you can share your your screen. But I, I have yours ready as well. OK, let's, let's move to share that. I'll give that a shot here. All right. All right, <clears throat> can you see this? We got it, Carl. Okay, uh, greetings everyone. Um, Carl Garman, Office, FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation, and uh, my thanks to the panel chair, Jeff Weinrichs, for introducing this topic. In the following slides, I frame some thoughts uh, for our conversation. So these images depict the variety of operational concepts of modern commercial space launches. Let's talk about what that involves. First of all, commercial space is definitely not a new entrant. Um, the FAA has licensed launches since the 1980s, and they've done so through uh, our authorities in Title 51 U.S. Code, which essentially is to regulate the safety of commercial space launches and reentries. Uh, and we also have another mandate, which is to encourage, facilitate, and promote commercial space launches and reentries, specifically by the private sh private uh, uh, sector. What you see from these slides, uh, and these are all li FAA licensed uh, uh, activities here. Uh, the diversity of operating concepts is increasing, so you see both suborbital and orbital uh, vehicles, disposable and also reusable. Capture carry, like you see under the belly of a of a, an airborne mothership uh, in the upper left and the, the center uh, center bottom uh, picks, and also the traditional rocket stack, uh, like you see uh, in, the, in the lower right hand. Um, you see also return to to site and also typical splashdown activities. So the the variety of those operating concepts is increasing, and we license these uh, all of them. So next one, <clears throat> when do you en end up talking to FAA commercial space? Why not Space Force? Why not NASA? Well, the analogy I use here uh, is it's like the Capitol Beltway. If you're going to take a trip around the Capitol Beltway, you're dealing with an on-ramp and you're dealing with an off-ramp. And the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, the FAA, uh, really are very similar by analogy to that on-ramp and that off-ramp. If you are a, a U.S. person, to include corporation, uh, or you're launching from the United States or a place subject to U.S. jurisdiction, you have to get a launch license. If you're re-entering a spacecraft, you need to get a re-entry license. So for U.S. commercial space activity, that's really us. We're the on-ramp and the off-ramp. Um, so that, that's kind of like a, the tie-in between aviation or aerospace weather and commercial space is really focused on these on-ramps and off-ramps. Um, weather, of course, affects the day of, of, of operations activities considerably um, in commercial space launches and re-entries, just like they do in aviation weather. So that's a commonality here of those, those day of operations activities end up influencing us uh, profoundly. Well, let me talk about just one example, just a highlight, not the only example, of course, but just kind of one example of some ways that traditional aviation weather may not, uh, uh, might not completely transfer over to, to uh, space launches and reentries. If we're a meteorological example, there's something called triggered lightning. And um, rockets, primarily like vertical launches, it's a different type. The, the physics are the same, of course, but the realm of the atmospheric physics that you're dealing with can 
can differ quite significantly and have, have very profound impacts upon your operations. So what does weather have to do with commercial space operations? Beyond the beyond those things like, okay, whether there's a winds or hurricane or rain or something that affects aviation and space launches and re-entries, let me kind of just tease out one example here of, of lightning and in cases where launch lightning almost changed history. And I want to caveat this, none of the examples that I'm going to show here were FAA licensed commercial launches, but we seek to learn the applicable uh, lessons from each of these experiences. Take the one on the left. And uh, my regrets for the for the fuzzy images, a lot of these were very, very uh, short exposure uh, 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 footages on wet film back in the day uh, to capture the phenomena. But on the left, Apollo 12, 1969, triggered lightning led to near mission failure. So it led to a near abort of the second crewed lunar landing mission, but quick intervention by that crew enabled continued flight. That lightning incident almost changed history. Because remember Apollo 12, you remember what happened just before that was Apollo 11, the first uh, landing on the moon to the lunar surface and back. And the following mission, Apollo 13, was itself cut short due to uh, some issues that were already baked into uh, uh, to the spacecraft hardware itself. Two consecutive failures on 13 and if 12 had failed, would likely have ended the Apollo lunar program, resulting in only one crewed lunar landing instead of six. This event spurred considerable research into triggered lightning. Fast forward almost two decades, this was an Atlas Centaur launch at the Cape in 1987. Lightning strike, uh, which hit the vehicle and then came down the, uh, the, the conductivity path, was down the vehicle's uh, exhaust path, which of course was, was ionized, and then to the launch gantry set off a chain of events that resulted in the loss of the launch vehicle and the payload. Fast forward another three decades from that, there was some very compelling footage that appeared on YouTube of what appeared to be a Russian Soyuz launch uh, out, of, out of Central Asia. Um, other than some videos that are available online, verifiable data is not forthcoming on this. So if you have a link to publishable, verifiable, peer-reviewed uh, data on this, either I or some colleagues of mine would be very interested in talking to you uh, about that. So the perennial challenge is here to protect the public and enable launch operations. So some likely challenges and opportunities that you have arising from this, and this transcends aviation weather. These are more general than that. Challenges, you have more diverse, capable, and frequent operations, uh, and weather and airspace constraints are, are among them. You are always dealing with constraints due to airspace uh, and, and weather. Opportunities. I would say increasing the fidelity and the integration of day-to-day -day operations data. So like meteorological and air traffic data, I can identify that as an opportunity. And the challenge and an opportunity, which is kind of combined, is uh, the FAA issued performance-based licensing regulations back earlier this year and they're performance based in that they specify a performance outcome and it is up to industry to innovate in order to meet the end goal of that. So they are less prescriptive, more performance based, but though to make the system work, those do require uh, industry actively engaging in helping produce standards uh, and also uh, knowledgeable practitioners to actually uh, do the licensing work. So I'll I'll close with these, these words, aerospace safety regulations, which is what we deal in. There are rules made with rocket science and you have a trade off here. It's because the thoroughness, speed and flexibility often emerge as, as triple constraints. Uh, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not a, a, a very, it's not a one dimensional type of field is that there's, you have trade offs, but one thing that we do not trade off on uh, is the public safety piece. Everyone here, of course, is interested in mission assurance, but primarily my office's uh, real, or I shouldn't say primary, our office's focus is the safety of the uninvolved public. Um, so even if you get a launch which doesn't succeed to its stated objectives, as long as that debris um, does not go outside of the designated hazard area for which we've controlled the, the public safety risk criteria, we consider that launch um, for public safety purposes, a success.
So there's a little bit of difference in, in success criteria. We're focused on the safety of the uninvolved public. Uh, Jeff, I'll hand it back to you. That, that concludes my intro. All right, thank you so much, Carl. Um, next we have um, Hazel Bain. Uh, can you hear me all right, Hazel? Yep, can you hear me? I can, I can. So I'll introduce you uh, uh, quickly. Um, Hazel Bain is a research scientist at the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Science at the University of Colorado Boulder and NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center, currently specializing in development of tools for operational space weather forecasting. In particular, her work focused on solar, um, solar radiation storm forecasting support of SWPC uh, customers in the aviation and human space exploration industries. Uh, so hey. welcome, Hazel. Uh, can uh, you see my slides? Uh, no. Oh, OK. Uh, let me see it. I think you have a copy of them, too, if you want to share uh, them. I do. I own. do. Yeah, absolutely. I can. Okay. Let's see. We've got backups and backups to the backups. And backups, <laughs> and backups, and backups. We do, we do. All right. Can you see that? Uh, see your presentation? Yep. Perfect. All right. Great. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Okay. So uh, thanks for the invite to speak today. Uh, Randy had asked me to cover some of the products and services that we offer at NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. Um, and so this is uh, an overview of some of that. So if you could switch to the next slide, please. Jeff, can you switch to the next slide, please? Thank you, perfect. Uh, okay, so uh, at the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center based here in Boulder, uh, we are the nation's official source of space weather alerts, uh, watches uh, and warnings, uh, and also of other services and situational awareness and information in, um, to the general public. Uh, and so as a sort of very quick overview that, that covers things from uh, geomagnetic storms, from coronal mass ejections occurring on the sun that can cause impacts to you know, the electrical grid and all sorts of things like that. Um, radio blackouts, which are of course are important for communications. And then the big one here for what we're talking about today is the solar radiation storms. Um, so these are energetic charged particles that are coming from eruptive events on the sun. Um, and if you could go to the next slide. So this is our solar S storm, uh, uh, solar radiation storm S scale. Uh, this is uh, so our way of communicating to our customers and to our users how intense the storm is uh, and what those effects may be uh, to those users. So you can start down from an S1 storm, which is just something relatively minor, uh, and then all the way up to an S5 storm. And so each of these levels goes up in an order of magnitude in terms of the intensity. And so that you can see there that if you and you can find this on our website, that this sort of communicates those impacts to systems like satellite operator, uh, satellite um, systems to so the biological impacts to astronauts or um, who are in EBA or who are up at ISS or who are traveling elsewhere. Uh, and then also down to sort of aviation levels uh, and whether or not we expect to see uh, elevated radiation levels on sort of uh, commercial uh, flight levels. And so we have customers that use these, uh, use the scale all the way across, um, you know, from HF comms to navigation, like people at NASA looking at the, the biological impacts to crew. Uh, and we have, you know, users across all of the major airlines, et cetera, across the US. So these are all public things. So anyone can, can get to these uh, alerts uh, and warnings. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the radiation um, forecast, we have two different approaches to this. Uh, we try to have uh, our one, two and three days long term probabilistic forecasts. And these come out every day at uh, 22 UT and they will give you a probability of an event occurring in the next day one, day two or day three. And so this is very much used for, for longer term planning and um, certainly from a NASA perspective, like thinking about whether you'd want to do an EVA in those couple of days uh, or maybe whether you'd want to schedule a launch or perhaps postpone a launch in those next couple of days. So this is specifically based on um, the threshold of 10 MeV protons at the GOES spacecraft, uh, NOAA's GOES spacecraft 
exceeding uh, a particular threshold of 10 PFU. And so that's pretty minor. That's still a pretty minor storm. And so as the event progresses, you would see it go up through the different S scale levels. Um, on the other hand, um, because we're not, the science and the understanding is not quite there yet to have really accurate predictions out as far as day one, day two, day three. And um, we also support this with much shorter term warning and alert products. So these were the three days is kind of on the daytime scale. We have these short warning products, which are on the minutes to hours uh, sort of time frame. And this is specifically uh, a warning here. You can see on the, on the right hand side is when uh, that red line there will cross the, uh, the, that, the blue dashed line. That would be the S1 um, scale. And so we'd have a warning, which we'd hope would go out before that threshold is crossed, telling users, hey, we look, we think there's going to be an event coming, we think it's going to cross the threshold, and hopefully here's a, an idea of when. Um, and then an alert follows up, and that is showing you that the conditions have been met for that event. So you'd have the warning to say something's coming, and the alert follows up to say that the threshold has been crossed. And so we have warnings and alerts for 10 MEVs uh, at 10 PFU, but then also a higher NG particles, which is kind of more of interest for for people who are going into space because the higher energies are more likely to penetrate through an EVA suit or, or something like that. Uh, and so we have warning and alerts for 10 MEVs crossing one PFU. And so that's the kind of thing that NASA would be looking for is, is those higher energies. Although they certainly want the situational awareness of, of if, if anything's going on. Uh, Hazel, next slide. Uh, Hazel, before you go off of that slide, would you be for this uh, space weather ignoring is so kind as to decode MEV and PFU? Sure. Sure. Um, so uh, MEV is uh, 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 mega electron volt. So it's just an energy measure. So it's telling you how energy the how energetic the, the protons are. And this is specifically protons that we're looking at. So 10 MEVs is kind of some people would consider that pretty low. And certainly from a from a let's talk about NASA and talk about EVAs. So EVA suits are um, you should start to get worried about the radiation from them round about 30 to 50 MeV. And certainly from a kind of a spacecraft perspective, once things get up to 100 MeV. So 10 MeVs is something that we have sort of traditionally um, given warnings and alerts for from a forecast perspective, because we have people in the satellite industry and things that the people who care about that. But in terms of sort of energies, what for sort of space travel and things like that, you want to start thinking in the 30 to 50 MeVs and then certainly the 100 MeVs. And then if we were getting events, to give you an idea of a really big event, an aviation level industry would feel things when you start getting 500 MEVs being, um, you know, above the background at one of these spacecraft, uh, the GOES spacecraft. So, so that kind of gives you an idea of where the scale is. So to feel something in aviation, you'd be seeing um, particles at 500 MEV. Uh, obviously, NASA cares about 100 and above, and then they also care about 30 and 50 if for particular occasions where the astronauts would be outside of, uh, of, a, of a vehicle. Um, and the, as for the PFU, that's particle flux units. And so that's telling you just about like the amount of particles you're seeing in, in a unit volume in a, in a particular time period in, in an area. So that's just kind of giving you, uh, yeah, just an intensity level for the event. Does that help? Perfect, thank you. Great. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I, I threw this in here because it's something that's new, but it's it's still it's it, you know this is pretty low levels in terms of uh, space travel, but but maybe this the ICAO will eventually you know exceed our higher altitudes. So this is something we started doing in two thousand and nineteen. The International Civil Aviation Organization asked, uh, well, three global space weather centers. There's now going to be four, but at the time, three global space weather centers to provide. Um, advisory space weather advisories uh, on um, things that could impact aviation radiation uh, communications and navigation and so in terms of the radiation we now have um, uh, advisories that go out that show uh, whether we expect to see elevated radiation at flight levels between 25,000 and 60,000 feet uh, in a thousand feet increments and that's when the radiation would pass these what we call moderate and severe thresholds which are uh, 30 microsieverts per hour and 80 microsieverts per hour so uh, I'll not go spend any more time on this because it's a lot lower than, in the altitude than what we're talking about, but it's just to show that in terms of radiation, SWIPSI has products that are very much from a in-space perspective, but then also at sort of uh, commercial aircraft uh, flight levels too. And perhaps we're, we're working on that part in the middle where, where we could sort of fill in the middle in terms of what's happening in the radiation belts. Those are models that we're also sort of looking at. Uh, next slide, please. 
So for the most part, uh, astronauts that are sitting in the like the equivalent of the International Space Station where you're in low Earth orbit, they're largely protected from the effects of solar energetic particles by the Earth's magnetic field. I think there's maybe, I think on an, in terms of a 90 minute orbit, orbit, you maybe have 10 minutes where you're a little bit more exposed than what you are for the rest of the time. But, you know, for the most part, you're very well protected from the Earth's magnetic field. However, as we start thinking about going beyond low Earth orbit and we're thinking about going back to the Moon and Mars, astronauts are going to be much more exposed to all aspects of the storm. Uh, and this, this is going to require much more enhanced forecasting from our perspective. Uh, we're going to have to talk about all clear forecasting, particularly. So uh, the idea that if you were um, you were traveling or something and you wanted to do an EVA, um, whether or not you would expect there to be a, a storm in the next few days, whether that would be smart to go across ahead with the EVA or to perhaps postpone. We need to be looking at trying to forecast these things before they happen on the sun. Like at the moment, we're very much in a reactive mode that when we see something eruptive on the sun, we can give a forecast. But we want to try and extend that sort of back in time to be able to predict before the eruption occurs, whether we expect a radiation storm. And then we it's really difficult at the moment to determine what the peak of the event is going to be just from these remote observations that we have. So that's something that needs a lot more work there, too. And then also to really understand the duration and evolution of these storms. Um, particularly from a, a human space exploration perspective, if you want to have um, astronauts sheltering from a storm, and it really is felt like the, the the sort of the solar component of the radiation that you could mitigate that from a, a radiation shelter, but you don't you don't want to have an astronaut in there for days on end. You want to know when the worst part is going to be and when they can get out to move around uh, around the the capsule uh, with relative safety. And so that's kind of where we're going in the future is to understand these aspects. Uh, so next slide, please. And so in terms of support for uh, for crewed missions, SUBSEA has supported uh, NASA, the Space Radiation Analysis Group, so NASA SHRAG. We have supported um, them 24-7 for many years, way back to the Gemini and Apollo missions, right through to the International Space Station. Uh, and that involves daily briefings to SHRAG. It involves uh, sort of every day just getting a situational awareness of what's happening on the sun and whether anything's anticipated. Obviously, during active periods, those commu com communications ramp up, uh, and especially during special activities such as launches and EVAs, uh, and especially during this this particular um, uh, very active period in 2003 called the Halloween storms, SUBSEA issued 140 alerts, warning and watches to NASA Johnson uh, during that time period. So it's a very active communication and, and a very um, successful partnership that has exactly which has lasted many decades at this point. Uh, so next slide, please. And so this is we're we're in the process of signing an interagency agreement to continue that support for the radiation environment uh, to NASA for uh, for the conduct of all human spaceflight. So this is going to be the extension of all our observations and briefings, our twenty four hour forecasts, warnings, alerts really for all aspects of space weather, you know, like they, they're most interested in the radiation, but they certainly are um, a very well space weather educated uh, users. So we can certainly talk to them about whether we expect there to be geomagnetic storms coming or what other kinds of solar activity is going on for their own situation awareness. And they will then inform the flight surgeon if whether or not they think there's any reasons uh, for, the shelter, for the astronauts to shelter or whatever, or if there's a no go on the mission. And so I've, I've talked a lot about here about sort of NASA and sort of government um, human space flight opportunities, but I think all of these products are publicly available. And so certainly this will be something that is accessible to commercial to the commercial sector. And as we make advancements in our understanding and in our forecasting um, for requirements for NASA, certainly that is going to be available for the commercial industry to, to contact too. Uh, and certainly that's something that, um, you know, SpaceX has occasionally called the forecast office and just asked for an update on whether or not they expect a radiation storm coming up in the next few days before a launch or something. So uh, certainly that communication is there and these forecasts are, are public so um, anyone can use them. And in future, we hope to be able to give a much more uh, fine grained forecast as we start to understand more about these events. So I will leave it there. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And uh, next, is uh, Kristen Smith on? Yep, I am here. Welcome. Thank you. Filling in for Kathy Rice today. Sure. Um, so did you want to introduce yourself? 
Sure, so uh, like we just mentioned, my name's uh, Kristen Smith. I work in the KSC Weather Office with my other colleague, Kathy Rice. I've been with KSC for about nine years now. I spent some time previously at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center as well as a contractor and um, have been involved with weather both at NASA and at KSC. My background is in atmospheric science. I have uh, my Bachelor of Science, Master's and PhD all in atmospheric science. And within the KSC Weather Office, one of the primary things that I do is focus on the Lightning Launch Commit Criteria, which I'll get into in our slides um, when we get into the presentation. So uh, Jeff, if you're able to bring those slides up. I don't have a final call. Sure, sure, no problem. Okay. All right. You able to uh, see this okay? Yep, I can see it. Okay, perfect. All right, so we'll go on to the next slide. Get into some of the background on Kennedy Space Center. On slide two. So Kennedy Space Center, as most of you no, the, the shuttle program ended back uh, around 2011, and we've been going through this transition period where Kennedy Space Center was focused on the space shuttle program, and we've transitioned into a multi-user spaceport. So it's not just about uh, NASA vehicles, NASA missions. We have transitioned our space center into accommodating the commercial launch entities as well. And some of those groups are displayed on the screen here from your SpaceX to your Blue Origin and United Launch Alliance to Boeing as well. So it's not just about NASA anymore. We are evolving and opening up to others outside of the government agency as well. So going on to the next slide. Just getting into a little bit about what KSC Weather does at NASA in our weather office. So we do a variety of things. Uh, we do a little bit of operational weather support. The majority of the forecasting is done by our counterparts at the 45th Weather Squadron, which is just across the river at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Uh, but Kathy and I have supported in the past some um, um, weather operations that have been at Stennis Space Center, uh, at least when it comes to some of the tropical weather support and other support that they needed that they couldn't get elsewhere. KSC Weather, uh, we're also overseeing the weather instrumentation and also the weather data that is collected out at KSC. The instrumentation um, is helped, is um, maintained by our counterparts at the 45th Weather Squadron. Uh, but in addition to that instrumentation, KSC also has what we call a trop tropospheric Doppler radar wind profiler, which is that center picture there. It's a, an array of about 640 antennas, and it was updated over the, the last five years or so from a, a 50 megahertz Doppler radar wind profiler to um, a profiler that is at a slightly the same uh, profiles of the winds at upper levels. Our weather data, uh, we also make sure that it is archived and it's also publicly accessible on our website, which I'll just, I show on one of the later slides as well, so you can go and visit that. And we're always looking for ways to improve um, our interactions with others, the research that we do, the services we provide, uh, we do have a local uh, mesoscale model, which is depicted in the lower left-hand corner of the slide. This was created by our Applied Meteorology Unit a few years back. 
And this is used by the weather forecasters at the 45th Weather Squadron, not just for day-to-day -day operations, but also for day of launch as well. Um, it's a great way to incorporate um, or look at the the weather at a more local scale than working than looking at some of the larger global models. So it's a terrific model that was tailored for Kennedy Space Center for the, the Eastern Range um, and is used daily. And we can go on to the next slide. Okay, just another look at what we're doing that's more centered around NASA. So the big focus right, focus right now is the Artemis 1 mission. And what we've shown here on the screen are the various stages of the development of Artemis. So in the upper left hand corner, this is uh, from the green run test that was conducted out at Stennis Space Center. And this was um, one of the things that Kathy and myself were keeping a close eye on, especially last year during our busy tropical season. I mentioned before that Kathy and I did provide a little tropical forecast for them um, okay. while they were getting ready to do their uh, green run tests. So um, we're very involved with that when it's needed. Uh, some of the other pictures on here just displays like the lower left hand corner. It's the barge that carried the core stage from Stennis to KSC. And then the other images just show the how the Artemis rocket has grown and is slowly being put together. And we're very looking forward to that launch in the very near future. We'll go on to the next slide. OK, so Carl um, did a nice segue for me into this slide. One of the, the big focuses, like I mentioned before, was the lightning launch commit criteria. And we've highlighted the same missions that Carl provided some great background on in the past. And it was the Atlas Centaur 67 mission back in 1987 that really led to the development of the lightning advisory panel, which is the group of experts that we rely on to further develop our lightning launch commit criteria. There were earlier versions of these rules um, that were used before Atlas Centaur 67, um, even back into the Apollo days, but they slowly transformed over time from being something very generic, like avoiding lightning to something where we're really trying to find ways where we can increase launch availability while still maintaining safety and keeping the crew payloads missions um, all safe. So this is something that we're very dedicated to. These criteria, um, while they are updated, uh, we also update the rationale behind those rules as well. And both the rules and the rationale are publicly available as well. And I'll show you on our website where you can access those. But this area, it, it's something that um, right now, um, I suppose you could say it's a little bit of a challenge where it comes to questions from the, the larger audience where, you know, everybody's trying to push the envelope, trying to, you know, increase this launch availability um, while we have to, still think about the the safety behind it. So we try to do research where we can. Um, we're trying to find ways to collaborate with those in the larger scientific community so we can be more aware of uh, certain lightning physics information, something that we may not know right now, but could be very useful if we did have a better understanding of that we could pass along to our lightning advisory panel for them to review and consider and hopefully use towards further modifying those rules. So we greatly appreciate any kind of collaboration we can do with researchers in that topic. We'll go on to the next slide. So this is just a little overview of 
how we develop the lightning launch commit criteria. Uh, right now, KSC Weather works as the liaison between the subject matter experts who are our lightning advisory panel and the larger community. Uh, KSC will talk with the technical users who we consider to be the launch weather officers, and these could be those at the 45th Weather Squadron, uh, out at Vandenberg, even at NASA Wallops. And we also interact with the FAA as well. So we greatly appreciate our relationship with the FAA and the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, especially when it comes to these difficult topics of lightning launch criteria and keeping um, safety uh, at the forefront. Uh, one of the other things that we do as well when there are updates with lightning launch commit criteria, we want to make the larger community aware of those changes. So some of the things that we do um, are highlighted below here in the lower right hand corner. We update the our, our colleagues at the day of launch working group, and that includes not just government agency, but it also includes the uh, commercial entities as well who are able to attend. Uh, we also give updates biannually at the Range Commanders Council. And more recently, we've been involved with the Air Force or Space Force meetings um, called Range Activity Customer Exchange, which is more geared towards the commercial entities as well. So any kind of forum that we're able to attend and provide updates to, whether or not it's on our lightning launch commit criteria or statuses at KSC, in regards to weather, we're more than happy to do and, and work with those groups. Let's go on, on to the next slide. Okay, and I think this is my last slide. So this is just a snippet of the homepage to our KSC uh, weather um, homepage. And it's something that we just released um, earlier this year and it has a lot of great information and in the drop down so what we've highlighted here is where you can find the latest updates for lightning launch commit criteria so you can click on the first document which we call our nasa standard 4010 and that is where the lightning launch commit criteria the rules themselves are in uh, the document and then the next document called rationales that's where you can find all the scientific justification for how the rules were developed and then we also have a history document which is also a nice recap of the evolution of the lightning launch commit criteria and the lightning advisory panel as well so these are some great documents that you can access on the website and some of the other drop downs we also have under the ksc weather data archive a link where you can access that publicly available weather data that is collected out at KSC. So it includes not only lightning data that is cloud to ground and lightning aloft, but uh, we have surface electric field mill data that covers the eastern range, as well as about 31 weather towers at various heights ranging from about 54 to 500 feet. And we collect temperature, relative humidity and wind data at those heights. So a lot of great information. Um, one other thing I'd point out as well under research and operations, we highlight um, some of those uh, research areas like our applied meteorology unit. Uh, there's a link to their website as well as some other um, interesting links in regards to projects in the past. So I think that is my last slide and I'll wrap up there. Thank you so much. So our um, so our last um, uh, panelist is um, Lieutenant Colonel Omar Nava, and he is the uh, Chief of Space Weather and Electromagnetic Effects, Weather Strategic Plans and Integration Division, Directorate of Weather Headquarters, United States Air Force, Washington D.C. He serves as the lead for space weather environmental environment issues with the services joint staff office of the secretary of defense intelligence community federal agencies and international partners in addition lieutenant colonel 
NAVA provides scientific perspective for developing interagency and international space weather analysis and forecast capabilities. He's also responsible for evaluating national and Department of Defense um, space weather strategic plans and programs to access their technical feasibility and operational implementation. Lieutenant Colonel Nava received his commission from the United States Air Force Academy in 2005 and earned his doctorate in atmospheric and oceanic sciences from the University of California, Los Angeles in 2016. Um, welcome, uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Um, uh, he doesn't have any slides, but we'll speak yeah. for a few minutes. Uh, so, uh, no, thank you for, I uh, should have sent you a, a shorter bio, sorry. Um, but, uh, you know, other than Hazel, um, you know, looking through the list of names, not too familiar with this particular community, but uh, I am excited to be here, you know, and thank you to the meeting organizers for reaching out uh, and inviting me to uh, speak today. And so, as you can probably tell, a lot of good diversity in the topics in this session, and, um, you know, I'm glad that Hazel talked about the solar radiation aspect, um, but I'm going to, uh, you know, talk about a little bit different aspect of the space environment. Uh, so to set the stage, uh, according to the uh, 2018 National Defense Strategy, one of our current and future challenges uh, in the in Department of Defense is operating in a space domain that is increasingly contested and congested. So, you know, should be no surprise to, to us here that frequency of launches has significantly increased uh, in recent years. A lot of commercial companies uh, getting into the business and now recently over the last uh, few months, uh, you know, space tourism. Uh, has a uh, you know has more data points now too, uh, and so all of these uh, aspects uh, you know these tie into basically this difficult mission of uh, you know achieving uh, what's called a space domain awareness, uh, and essentially it's the ability to be able to detect, uh, track, identify, and characterize space objects so satellites, debris, meteors, etc., uh, and even the space environment so uh, basically space weather aspects. And uh, all of this is aimed at supporting uh, space activities in terms of you know, safety, security, uh, and sustainability. And so for this talk, um, I'll provide a little more perspective on that tracking aspect uh, of a space domain awareness, and especially from the lens of uh, safety. Uh, so one example, uh, SpaceX, uh, it's pretty well known now that they're uh, on the process of building a, a satellite mega constellation. Uh, in order to you know provide global broadband internet service and you know no uh, of course I don't work for them um, but uh, no recently they've uh, gotten you know permissions from uh, the uh, FCC fly 12,000 Starlink satellites and at least from latest I saw uh, they've also filed paperwork to throw up another uh, 30,000 so you know you're looking about 42,000 uh, satellites in space and really to put this into you know some perspective uh, I think currently there's about maybe 4,300 uh, active artificial satellites and really about 11,600 or so have been launched in all of history. Uh, so, you know, they're they're putting a lot of stuff up in, up in orbit. And of course, that's going to be concerning. You know, at the moment, they're about uh, around 1,700 so far, um, but, uh, you know, they're they're making headway. And 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 as a note, it's, uh, they're putting these satellites in very low orbit, uh, which is going to come into play um, uh, later on in this talk. Um, but of course, it's not just the U.S. and it's not just SpaceX that's doing this. Um, also recently in the news, uh, China is also in the process of uh, putting up a national satellite internet mega constellation, and I definitely don't work uh, for them. Um, and they're looking to put up about uh, 13,000 satellites uh, in low Earth orbit there. And so, you know, in terms of space domain awareness, um, that is a tremendous number of uh, objects to uh, to track. And of course, you know, one of the immediate thoughts that goes in your head is, just want to make sure, you know, one, they don't collide into each other. Um, not only just the commercial to commercial assets, but, you know, commercial to, in my case, you know, national security assets. Um, also, you can sort of think about in international incidences, a U.S. Uh, commercial asset running into some other country's asset. And, and then amongst all of these uh, satellites, uh, also the uh, space debris. And so, you know, where does the, uh, you know, space weather come in and, and sort of why are we, at least the space weather community, um, very concerned, uh, especially over the next few years. So we've already started this uh, new 11-year solar cycle, um, basically defined as an increase in activity from the sun, um, basically increased heating of Earth's uh, upper atmosphere. And when you have when you heat Earth's atmosphere, you get expansion, and now you get densities from the lower altitudes, you know, raised up to the higher altitudes, uh, resulting in increased satellite drag. And so with the increased satellite drag, essentially what happens is while well, your objects now 
of course, they decrease in, in altitude and then they travel faster. So, you know, in other words, they're probably not going to be um, where, you know, where you think they originally were, you know, uh, similar when I leave my wife in like a Harry Potter store and just and turn around for a second, she's gone. Um, so, you know, that's a that's a big concern with the with the significant satellite drag. And of course, it's not a, a local uh, effect, it's global. So, you know, imagine applying that to 40,000 Starlink satellites, 13,000 of China's um, satellites, and then of course, other objects that are already up there. And now you sort of have this nightmare scenario for, you know, space domain awareness where you have thousands, tens of thousands of objects um, that aren't necessarily, you know, where you think they're going to be. And so trying to figure out if there's going to be any collisions um, and trying to make sure that you send out notifications in time. Um, this is a, yeah, it's pretty much a, a nightmare scenario. And so that's just the satellites themselves, you know, bringing up a, the space debris that's already up there, uh, at least according to the latest numbers I had. Um, so last solar max uh, was in 2012, and around that time, there were about 11,000 pieces of space debris, about 10 centimeters or more. I think that's about the size of a softball. Uh, and uh, latest estimates as of this year, you're looking at about you know 27,000. Uh, so uh, definitely more than double uh, of that just space debris, um, 10 centimeters or more uh, right now as we're heading into the next uh, next solar cycle. Um, and so, you know, Sun has an 11 year solar cycle, as I mentioned, so we expect a steady increase in just, uh, you know, satellite drag effects over the next uh, few years. Um, but of course, we just don't worry about the activity on this, you know, just the, the increased um, energy coming out of the Sun. Uh, there's also, you know, sporadic events of uh, increased solar activity, such as, you know, coronal mass ejections, some that last uh, a few days. And, and these types of events inject huge amounts of energy into Earth's upper atmosphere. And as you can imagine, uh, a lot of heating, a lot of expansion of the atmosphere, a lot of drag, um, and it's been a you know well-known cases over the last few years where um, you know it's just uh, folks have had a you know difficult time trying to track all these objects for these significant um, storms. So you know sort of a one-two punch with increased solar activity and now you know the increased frequency uh, of these events. And you know sort of the, glad uh, Carl had mentioned you know there's uh, the on-ramp off-ramp uh, analogy. Uh, you know, increased satellite drag also affects uh, re-entries, uh, as you imagine, if you're not project, you know, projecting uh, whatever object you're looking at, uh, vehicle to enter, um, you know, uh, enter sooner because of uh, increased satellite drag, uh, that can cause uh, problems, safety problems as well. You know, trying to make sure that you know, the objects coming back in don't land where you don't want them to land. So, uh, just another aspect there that I'm glad he uh, he mentioned. Um, so overall, you know, you could say that really this, you know. Even though I'm talking from space weather aspect, really space object tracking this issue uh, really inherently is a terrestrial uh, weather problem with the uh, neutral atmosphere basically extending out, uh, of course, into space. Um, but it is influenced by uh, solar activity. So, at least uh, you know I'm a basically homegrown uh, weather officer meteorologist, uh, but I spent a lot of time on the on the space weather side. And so, at least for me, uh, my perspective, it's it's been beneficial to have you know uh, experience in those two regimes and. And, and I think that's, you know, at least whenever I see uh, normal terrestrial weather officers, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to to have that uh, space experience or knowledge as well, because I mean, it's all it's all mixed together, it's intertwined. And of course, you know, DOD is constantly working to improve its modeling capabilities, especially for uh, space object tracking. And even in the recent news, last few months, uh, Space Weather Prediction Center, where uh, Hazel is, um, rec recently released their um, whole atmosphere, ionosphere, plasmasphere. Electrodynamics model. So basically, the whole atmosphere model takes GFS uh, and extends its lid all the way up to 400 to 600 kilometers. So you're capturing, you know, that low uh, that low or, uh, Earth orbit uh, regime, uh, especially for you know these uh, the satellite drag effects. Um, and so you know, in conclusion, uh, you know, of course, the DoD is a is a is a strong proponent of uh, commercial space capabilities. That shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, interesting thing, recent development in the last few years, you know, since 2015. Uh, within the Combined Space Operations Center at now Vandenberg Space Force Base, uh, there's a, a new commercial integration cell. Um, and first, I think that's a great thing where they, they found in previous exercises that having, um, you know, that access to uh, to real time and near real time information from uh, commercial satellite owner operators um, really improved uh, that uh, that space domain uh, awareness um, aspect. And so. You know, it's and so I mentioned all of this, and you know, even Starlink and and and, and other uh, companies are putting up satellites in space. Even though you know we have to deal with 
with sort of that, that crowding issue, um, really from the DOD's perspective, we're more reliant, more and more reliant on commercial space. And uh, we're really concerned about the satellite drag aspect is because we want to make sure that, you know, the capabilities uh, that the commercial side provides, uh, want to make sure that they're going to be available when we really need them. Um, and so, of course, you know, as we ramp up through this, uh, this upcoming so uh, solar cycle over the next few years, um, it's going to be definitely quite challenging. And so that concludes my talk for now. Um, thank you. All right, <clears throat> thanks so much. Um, so that's all the uh, panelists we have for uh, this session. So we have um, um, go into our um, panel discussion right now. And our second moderator is going to take over with uh, questions uh, for the panel. So, so Jeff, did you want to go through some of the questions here to to kick off the? Um... Sure, sure. Yep. Okay, we have a we have a few that have come in, and I'll uh, hit a couple of the easy ones first uh, for Hazel because she was so proactive, made my job easy, and uh, she jumped in and um, answered them on the uh, chat room. But I wanted to highlight them because there's some good links in there. Um, earlier, uh, Matt. And uh, Matthias had asked questions. Matthias's question uh, was that uh, Hazel had mentioned S uh, WPC forecasts, uh, whether they were publicly available, or mentioned they were publicly available, and whether or not that included gridded data that could be integrated into uh, decision support tools. And then just tagging on to that, uh, Matt said he thought that the look ahead was very limited. Uh, for SWPC, and so I was interested to see that a three-day three -day forecast was issued. And is this for all space weather impacts or just a subset of them? And Hazel put into the uh, uh, chat uh, some links and some answers to that. Hazel, did you want to expand on what you have in the chat? Uh, any uh, response to? Uh, sure. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess that there's, <laughs> I forget about the IKEA forecast not necessarily being fully public yet. Um, yes, so the, all of our proton forecasts um, as part of the NOAA um, uh, S-scale and all that, that is all publicly available. And I put some links in the, the, uh, the chat box there for where people can subscribe or find those forecasts and a link to a paper that just shows a recent uh, verification study of those products to show you what our current skill is. Uh, <coughs> I just knocked over the, the lamp. Never mind. <laughs> um, uh, yes, yeah, so the, the, a link to um, the uh, to a paper that looks at a recent forecast verification study that uh, tells us what our recent performance uh, uh, skill and uh, metrics and all that are for that. So if people are interested, they can go and look there. The IKEA forecasts are, are not the the gridded data is is not available just yet. Um, that's something that the the um, the three or four uh, forecast centers are working on. Um, and I think part of that is because some of it is, at the moment we're kind of in this sort of two year, we're just getting going and seeing how all of this works. And some of it is uh, related to, there's some private industry in there too. So at some point there may be cost recovery for some of these forecasts at some point in the future in, in for different parts of you know the globe and where people decide to subscribe to that. Um, but Hopefully that'll be something that we can share in the future. Certainly the, the forecast that goes to IKEO is takes that gritty data and sort of distills it down to a text-based advisory. And that was something that we saw coming from the aviation industry through our customer requirement survey was that people wanted that information in a way that was sort of understood by the aviation community. And these these gritty, these um, text-based forecasts were modeled from the uh, volcanic ash uh, advisories. And so it just is a very quick snapshot of that information. But certainly we hear that we're hearing that there are people would be interested in being able to see the map and being able to see how that globally distributes. Uh, in terms of the the three day products, um, yes. So there's we have our three day probabilistic forecast for the radiation storms. We also have three day probabilities for um, the big solar flares, the M and the X class solar flares, uh, and then also for some geomagnetic activity. And so uh, th that's available on the website. Uh, and I can I'll stick a link in there that shows you our archive that people can go back and look and see what the uh, the different forecast products look like. So they come out through our report on solar and geophysical activity, so the RSGA, and then also our three day product, which 
gives you, <laughs> funnily enough, three days worth of forecasts. So those are all available on the SWPC website. And, and and for everyone on the call, uh, if you're at least using the Teams uh, app, uh, I'm not sure about if you use it through a browser, but the chat room is archived for the uh, all the way back to the beginning of the meeting on Monday. So you, you can go back and refer to that anytime. And sometimes because of that, it's a little hard to find. So Hazel's links are at the uh, timestamps of 1216 and 1223 today. So you can go right to that. And I think she said that she was adding one more there about now. So anyway, uh, that that's how you find them. So thank Hazel. Um, there was a couple that came in for Carl. Um, and it was also from, um, one was from Randy Bass and one was from Matthias. Uh, from Randy Bass, are there any gaps for Carl? Are there any gaps in the weather support commercials to, I'm sorry. Are there any gaps in weather support to commercial space, either terrestrial or space weather, launch orbital reentry that you believe needs particular attention? So I'll leave that one uh, to you first there, Carl. Uh, thanks, Dave, and, and thanks, Randy. Um, I'm going to stay pretty, to answer that, I'll stay pretty close to the scope of the mandate for my office. Uh, so the operator, the actual licensee that holds the commercial space launch or reentry license, the operator is responsible for controlling their trajectory. So if there are weather issues that would affect that trajectory, really that responsibility is on the operator to understand and, and account for that, to make sure that their, their trajectory is kept to within the scope of that license. Um, so what do those look like? Those are typically, what, I mean, day of launch, right? Uh, winds, synoptic, mesoscale, local meteorology. Um, if you look in our, our regulations, the ones that the performance-based regs, is they're very outcome oriented. You will only see the word weather, quote unquote, the word weather, actual text, mentioned once. You'll see it exactly once. And you will only see that word weather when it comes down to the list of items that an operator has to provide if there is a mishap. They have to provide a report on the weather conditions um, at the time of the mishap. So when you when you talk about gaps, I'll kind of tie that back to, to the differentiation between the public safety piece and the, the uh, uh, mission assurance piece, all right? Everyone's typically interested in, in mission assurance, but my office is really interested in the public safety piece. Um, I doubt if an, if an operator would want to launch when there is a high probability of them losing their payload. Operators tend not to make money when they lose payloads due to things that they could prevent. But realize our main focus is the public safety piece, and it's the operator's responsibility for controlling their trajectory. And if they go outside the bounds of what's authorized in the license, it's considered a mishap, and that would trigger the reporting of that. As far as like space weather, like on orbit type of stuff, my office does not have on orbit authority. Um, also, interestingly, we're actually constrained by the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act of 2004. We have a very tight scope of things that we can regulate, especially when it comes to the newest one you may see in, in media reports is commercial space flight uh, participants, uh, space tourists for, for, for normal people. Um, we're very constrained by statute as to what we can regulate uh, regarding regarding design or re regarding crew um, up until a sunset date of 2023. Um, Congress has twice extended the, the length of that moratorium and the current date goes through uh, 2023. I'm not going to venture. I'm not going to venture a prediction of what our friends just up the street on the hill may choose to do with that moratorium. That is in the legislative sphere and not in the regulatory sphere because it tracks to our authorizations under Title 51 U.S. Code. That gives a little bit of a of a 360 round about that. But in bottom line, Randy is really it's the operator making sure that that they can control their trajectory based on what's in the license. And so they're primarily interested in what the weather piece is. Uh, you know, I have a question kind of tied to uh, uh, a couple of comments you've made about uh, I, the illustration that you deal with the on ramps and the on uh, off ramps. 
and, and you don't your office does not have the on orbit authority what what is the vertical extent of the end of the uh, off uh, on ramp or the uh, beginning of the on ramp it's determined by what's considered end of launch so redefine that as the last control of the vehicle or the last control of the launch vehicle upon the launch which of course since you're dealing with with launch vehicles that are very different that that depends if, for of exactly physically what that means it varies from one launch application to another launch application and a lot of that is is a uh, is hammered out through the process of the of the licensing uh, uh, the licensing process pre-application we actually grant the launch license and then that'll be in there and then we'll reg from a regulatory span standpoint dave uh administer to what's considered um end of launch Lab but essentially it's the last control of the launch vehicle okay um and uh, matthias asked for you carl if you could elaborate a little bit more on weather constraints uh besides lightning uh for uh, uh space launch and re-entry I'm not sure what's meant, what you mean by constraints. Matthias, do you want uh, to elaborate on your question about elaboration there? Sure. Uh, I mean, there are certain weather conditions. Lightning is one of them where you wouldn't launch because you have impacts on that. And maybe the question to a certain degree could also be answered by Kristen, who you know, provides weather support for these uh, space launches and re-entries, I would assume as well. In terms of what weather aspects are you looking for to avoid? Let's say if the winds are too strong or in a certain way, that may affect how your you know, or a vehicle is launching or, or gets drifted off its path in certain ways. Uh, or if there is a failure of the launch, where is the debris going, et cetera. So there are certainly different weather aspects that play into the thinking as you plan and execute these launches. That's what I was uh, wondering, what aspects uh, of weather go into that thinking? If you could elaborate, either you, Carl, or, or Kristen, or, or maybe Omar as well. I don't know. Carl, do you want me to take this one? Sure. All right, so there are different types of constraints that are looked at. Some are more user constraints that, um, like Matthias, you had mentioned, um, upper level winds, and that comes into play when it comes to loads and, and vehicle trajectories, things like that. So that's user defined, um, at least, what goes into consideration when you talk about probability of violation when the 45th Weather Squadron or um, Vandenberg and, and Wallops uh, do this as well. Their probability of violation or POV, that takes into consideration the Lightning LCC, Lightning Launch Commit Criteria, and then some of the mission specific user constraints which could include surface winds, temperature and if the vehicle can or can't fly through precip but the pov wouldn't include certain user constraints like upper level wind shear solar activity or recovery conditions so um, maybe like the wave height or um, wind speeds over the ocean so from that perspective that's what does and doesn't go into a probability of violation when it comes to those values that are put out by the launch weather officers um, so some are lightning launch commit criteria, other constraints are, are defined by the user. Great, thank you. And Matthias, uh, Carl here, if I could add on to what Chris mentioned, is uh, a lot of the weather items are, as Chris uses the term user defined, uh, from a licensing perspective, we would look at all right, what the, a lot of things, including even the trajectory, including the size of the hazard zone uh, to make sure that the public risk criteria, the expected casualty numbers don't exceed uh, an acceptable threshold. And, and so a lot of, so some of those things like would kind of depend launch to launch because a lot of it's based upon your trajectory characteristics of the launch vehicle, your 
expected uh, debris cat or your debris catalog for that particular launch or reentry vehicle. So a lot of these things are performance based specifically because they're the field is very, very diverse and you'd have to look at what is the expected outcome and then backtrack from that to get clear defined risk criteria. So it's I, I hesitate, or sorry, I, I should say this, I caution against drawing too close of an analogy um, with our with our friends in the aviation world. Uh, I, I, I would not liken it to saying, hey, you know, the cross max crosswind component is such and such, therefore you shall not take off. I would, this is, it, it's so dependent upon upon the characteristics of, of particular launches and reentries, the vehicle involves trajectory, the debris catalog, a lot of things, even the even the payload uh, also. The reason why Lightning gets such specific special attention and why you'll see soul sections on Lightning, but very little, little mention of weather as a bigger field, has to do with this. The main driver, and this is not, not uh, this isn't obvious if you just look at the reg from a uh, just from a plain text, but the background, the big reason why lightning gets a lot of very close attention is not because we're trying to protect the payload. It's not because we're trying to necessarily protect any human participants that are on board. It's to protect the flight safety system. The flight safety system or flight termination system, which essentially blows up the vehicle, the proverbial range controller to hit the button and blow the vehicle up if it goes, too much, you know, cross range uh, is there to protect the uninvolved public. If you had a lightning strike and it took out the the ability for that flight uh, safety system to activate, or or for the range control to send a signal there, or it it compromised the integrity of that flight safety system. Now you do have an uncontrolled hazard to the public. So the reason why. Lightning gets such attention is not so much to protect mission assurance. It's to protect the flight safety system because that is how you you large to a large extent can guarantee that the uninvolved public isn't put at risk due to an errant launch vehicle. But but you wouldn't get that just by a clear a, a crisp literal reading of of the reg. There's a lot of background packed into that. Great, uh, thank you. You, you guys are great because uh, Kristen's already put into the chat a, a link for frequently asked questions uh, on the criteria as well. So uh, check out that link there. I'm wondering, and, and Kristen, you mentioned wave height and it made me think uh, with the SpaceX, um, it's one thing for water landing. You have to be looking at certain criteria, but for the SpaceX where they have, have a couple of times landed on a platform out in the ocean, in the open ocean, does that has that presented any unique challenges from uh, from just a normal water landing or uh, other reentries you've you all dealt with, or for anybody there? So that's um, like in the the guide that I just put in the link and what I was describing earlier. Um, those recovery conditions. That's that's what's also looked at um, by the the specific uh, launch weather officer that's assigned to that particular mission. So they take all of that into consideration and um, would brief the the user, um, whether it's SpaceX or whomever, at, at what they're anticipating those conditions to be so they can make the call. OK, uh, thanks. Um, hey, Dave, Carl here. Can I just amend one quick thing I just mentioned? Yeah, please. All right. So in in addition, I, when I said to protect the flight termination system, let me let me qualify what I said earlier. That also also uh, covers any any uh, uh, safety critical systems. So any systems that are considered for the launch that are considered safety critical. I just mentioned the flight flight termination system or flight safety system as an example. But I, I don't want to mislead the audience to think that's the only thing I care about. It really it's it's safety critical systems again. For the for the intent of protecting the uninvolved public. OK, just because that's a distinction with a difference. Um, uh, another uh, a couple of questions came in from uh, Gordon Brooks for Kristen. Um, he said he missed the names of the local models that you're using. 
uh, do you use mesoscale ensemble data from the uh, Air Force uh, weather? Um, and, he, and he mentions that they have 24 and one kilometer ensemble coverage for Cape Canaveral and then work with the uh, 45th weather group. So I'm not sure all the different types of models that the 45th has available. I know they do use what they call the Galwin model. That's more of a global model. Um, but the one that I had mentioned, the mezzoscale model earlier, that's a, a wharf based model that's localized for our area. OK. Um, Eric asked, um, and this may have already been covered here. Did the weather criteria required for launch in terms of lightning strikes and ceilings change from space shuttle program to the current private ventures? So the criteria are are still essentially the same from with some slight modifications um, since the the shuttle program ended, but that's it's not based on necessarily commercial entities joining the mix. It's just based on uh, new information that the Lightning Advisory Panel may have, um, new questions that come up on whether it's day of launch or non-day of launch that the weather officers may relay back to my office. And then we bring to the Lightning Advisory Panel for them to think about and discuss and then either um, modify or, or keep the the rules as is but uh, we are getting a lot of questions from the larger um, commercial group about can you tailor the lightning launch commit criteria for a specific vehicle or can the lightning launch commit criteria be tailored or um, modified to be applicable to certain size vehicles can you have different lightning LCC for small vehicles like sounding rockets and then vehicles that are more mid-size and lar than large size or can the criteria be altered based on like the propellant type. So these are a lot of questions that we're trying to handle. Um, some research has been done by more graduate level students um, thanks to our counterparts at the 45th Weather Squadron, who've been working with some students um, coming up with these topics for them to look into. Uh, we also work with uh, local high schools that are interested in looking at ways that they can um, get involved with research and who are looking for topics to, to explore. So all of this information is just a great way of trying to address those questions that that come to us about the Lightning LCC and how they can be modified and improved. All right. Um, and one last one for Kristen here from Matt, uh, looking for his uh, identifying gaps. Uh, you suggested you try to do Lightning uh, research and development to the extent you can to refine and improve your Lightning launch commit criteria. And he says to him, it sounded like that uh, you were identifying R&D an R&D gap in this area. <clears throat> Would you care to comment on his comment? Sure. Yeah, so we've been identifying for, you know, the last couple of years now, and, and by me, I mean myself and, and the Lightning Advisory Panel and others, um, topics that would be very helpful if we knew more information about. And we've been working together along with um, Carl as well. Um, Carl and I talk very often about lightning launch commit criteria and other weather related topics. And uh, what we're looking and hoping to do is create some type of document. We're thinking right now a, a journal article, maybe through the, the AMS, where we can discuss more of the lightning launch commit criteria, give some of the background, its applications when it comes to operations and to highlight the areas in research where it, we would we find it would be very beneficial if we knew more knew more about and our hope is that these topics once we make the researchers aware of areas where we think we're lacking that whether it's students or other um, researchers who are more established um, within their career would be made aware of it and could uh, 
research it or, you know, look at it as from whether a campaign or anything else, um, some type of topic they could tack on to maybe their current work or or new work that they may be interested in looking into. Uh, we have a couple of questions for the panel in general, but then uh, Brian Pettick, you grew just uh, asked a, a question here just a moment ago, I believe is for you, Kristen. How much support, uh, since it's, I assume it's lightning, uh, how much support do you get from the Marshall Space Flight Group in Huntsville? So we, uh, I should have brought this up before um, when I was talking um, in my slides, but at KSC, we interact with all of our counterparts at all the different NASA centers um, on a frequent basis. We also collaborate and interact with the Space Force at both the Eastern Range and Western Range. Uh, we talk with our counterparts at the National Weather Service as well. So uh, we'd like to talk with everybody on a frequent basis. So we're each aware of what kind of struggles we're going through individually, how we can help each other. So Marshall is, is one of the groups that we interact with very, very frequently. And they're the group we turn to as our upper level wind experts. So they do uh, a lot, if not all of our analyses from a NASA perspective when it comes to upper level winds. All righty. Um... Uh, Omar, I have to ask, and maybe I just missed this, but um, w when there is a, uh, a strictly a DOD mission, how much interaction, I guess, do you have with kind of what is the civilian side, or are you all pretty segregated in that manner, or is there a lot of collaboration, or how, how does your interaction end up dealing with um, the groups at, the, at Kennedy there? So the, um, at least from what I understand, um, sort of familiar with the the ops at the at the 45th, but um, you know nowadays, you know pick whatever community like no one really works on their their own anymore. There's been a you know rec over the last few years, you know this big push to uh, you know really have that interagency collaboration. I really try to share you know from a research perspective, from an ops perspective, from a you know um, procedures perspective, really trying to share. Uh, what we can across you know across the different agencies uh, that way you know in general the community will then be be stronger so seeing that a lot on the on the space weather side and i'm sure i'm not too familiar on the uh, on the launch side um but uh you know that's it's a it's a nice thing seeing over the last few years just um this um you know military is not acting alone uh, we really do rely on interagency partners um uh, and as i mentioned with the uh, commercial integration cell uh, commercial partners as well um also you know bolster the mission and uh, really seeing uh, some good improvements. So um, looking forward to see what the future holds though. Great, thank you. Um, a question Matthias had for all the panelists. So uh, whoever wants to chime in first, uh, from all of your perspectives, uh, how will changing climate conditions affect low uh, orbit and space flight operations? So anybody want to go first on that? and not everyone at once. Matthias, do you want to elaborate any on uh, on what you're looking for there? Uh, well, I, I was trying to pick their brain in terms of understanding what they are concerned about. I mean, all the current concerns may still be there, but may be amplified in certain ways. We may see more convective storm, therefore more lightning activity, which may limit, you know, launch windows, et cetera. I mean, there is a full spectrum to it, how our conditions, the atmospheric conditions may change in the future and how that may affect operations or how it may affect also infrastructure. I mean, if we have significant sea level rise, suddenly KSC may be underwater and, and this launch pad may no longer be there as an option or stuff like this. I, I mean, I, I was really trying to see where, where pe what people are thinking about and getting concerned in terms of how our climate conditions may change. Sounds like there's more concern about the uh, the launch this month. Uh, 
but um, anyone care to comment on that? Uh, At least I know, um, I don't necessarily have that expertise, but I think uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rob Branham's in the in the in the chat and uh, I know he's very familiar with the climate aspects and um, so maybe he can chime in or um, put something uh, in there but uh, at least that's my response <laughs> phone a friend Over. Well, yeah this is, uh, uh, this is this uh, is lieutenant oh. colonel branham uh, 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 thanks uh, omar for that uh, you know and i'm going to talk about this this afternoon a little bit but you know, the DAF right now is really looking at, at uh, two two areas when it comes to climate change. And I think, you know, this group would do well to do the same is really taking a look at, uh, you, know, you know, from an operations perspective, particularly with fuel uh, consumption, particularly with, uh, you know, support to aviation operations, right? Mm -hmm. From the flying aspect, then there's the infrastructure piece. And we talked about that, you know, before a little bit that, that the, you know, the DAF itself is looking at, you know, how do we develop, you know, uh, installation resiliency plans for our, our infrastructure out there to, to support readiness, which, you know, that feeds into the flying operations piece. So I think that's that's something that we have to talk about, you know, going forth. <laughs> Uh, Jeff, we're we're up to about uh, three minutes before one or two minutes before one now. So that was the extent of the questions. But um, hey, Dave, uh, yes, sir. I can. Got it. This is Carl. I can on that. It's I'm kind of struggling with Matthias's question. An excellent question. Fair question. I'm kind of struggling with how to answer it from my agency's perspective because the scope of the of the climate change challenge is is it, it's a very long-term challenge. The scope of my agency's licensing authority really uh, is, is far, far shorter than that. Um, like I described earlier, you know, launch and then re-entry, the on-ramp and the off-ramp. So the, the amount of time that one spends on that proverbial on-ramp and off-ramp are orders of magnitude shorter uh, than, than, uh, than the challenges that he described. So that, that, that's kind of explains my reticence for a minute because I, I, I there's just a huge difference in time scales so I'm, I'm just trying to articulate an impact to to the scope of my agency's licensing authority when it comes to uh that issue yeah i was uh, kind of saying it tongue-in-cheek away but uh or a little facetiously but i think it's true that probably it sounds like from uh, most of the uh, uh issues that are being chased by this immediate panel are, are much more um near term so um not that there's not the issues uh for the longer term there but anyway um we're coming up at one o'clock so i wanted to give it back to uh to jim thank you for all that interaction there or jeff i'm sorry jeff sorry one of the j's no, no worries <laughs> thank you david uh appreciate you uh handling all the questions and thank you to uh all the panel this was a great discussion um, I knew there would be no lacking of questions. Um, so we're going to take a, a scheduled 30 minute break and uh, return at uh, 1 30 Eastern time and talk about multi use weather, which will last uh, uh, an hour and 10 minutes. So I'll, I'll see you at 1 30 Eastern time. Thanks so much. All right, Jeff, my uh, my sand dial is 1 30 exactly. And all three of your speakers who aren't named TBD are on and have all done sound check. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Um, so welcome back, everyone. Um, our <coughs> session now is going to be multi-use weather capabilities right. wow. that uh, well, agencies are working on. It could well, be good. And will be remote. And if you're uh, if you're not speaking, can you go on mute, please? Right. Right. Um, thank you. Um, capabilities that agencies are working on could be leveraged for aviation weather or has an aviation weather component. Uh, we have MRMS, satellite, and uh, DOE. Um, we have three panelists for this session. 
Um, and we'll uh, start with uh, Dr. Dan Lindsay, and he is the um, the NOAA Nestis Gozar Program Scientist. He has been with NOAA since 2004 in Fort Collins, Colorado, and specializes in satellite remote sensing of mesoscale phenomena from the geostationary platform, including thunderstorms, tropical cyclones, and aerosols, uh, such as smoke and blowing dust. So uh, welcome, uh, Dan, uh, and I know you're gonna share your presentation. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Just double checking, you can hear me okay? I can. Great. So while I'm sharing, I will just say, oops, you want to see my email. Uh, thanks to Randy for the invitation to participate today. And I will also say, for, uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. OK, yes. great. Um, I should also say that what I'm presenting today is largely the work of others, um, most specifically in, in this case, uh, Tony Wimmers and Yu Zhang No. Tony Wimmers from Sims and Yu Zhang No from Sierra and then lots of others who just generally work on, on Gozar. Um, so I work for NOAA NESDIS. That's, I think you probably all know this, but just to make sure, NESDIS is the satellite arm of NOAA. And my role is Gozar Program Scientist. So I, I, I would say that I probably work most with imagery itself, but um, I'm also pretty familiar with most of the products, both the operational products and the experimental products that we're working on. So I thought I would spend this five minutes just giving you a highlight of a couple of different products that we have um, to maybe whet your appetite. And see. And then during the discussion, we could talk about if there's interest in these among uh, the folks who are on the, on the meeting here. So first, just an example. Uh, this is one of my favorite volcano examples. This is actually the Himawari 8 satellite. A few, back in uh, 2017, we had an eruption on the south, the south end of Kamchatka of uh, the Kambalni Kal volcano. I may not be saying that right. This is the so-called ash RGB. And you can see, if you can see my mouse, uh, the, the ash is very evident right here, streaming to the south. But perhaps my favorite part of this is you can actually see contrails of the aircraft that are flying on the typical uh, from East Asia to North America route through this area. And you start to see as they get notifications of the volcano, they start to deviate their flight paths. And that's shown by these sort of kinks in the contrails that show up right there. I just thought this was a really neat example and it highlights the, the um, use or the utility of satellite data, particularly geostationary data uh, for volcanic eruptions. Here's another eruption, same area, a little bit further south, a couple of years later. This is Raikoki. This is a true color image which shows the volcano uh, spewing its ash up over the top of the low clouds, and the ash shows up really well in the, the brown color that it actually is, thanks to the uh, true color imagery from Himawari 8. And then a few days later, um, this volcano was active for days, and it spewed lots of things into the atmosphere, including lots of sulfate aerosols. And this is uh, the so-called SO2 RGB from GO-17, way to the east of the volcano. The yellows indicate these uh, aerosols and pr probably some ash mixed in as well. Um, and it really circulated up here among this low pressure system north of the Aleutians for days. And so again, any routes going from North America over to East Asia probably had to keep an eye out for this plume uh, because of the, uh, the dangers involved. OK, so I'm going to say a couple words about some experimental products we have uh, working right now. The first is automated turbulence detection. This is uh, led by Tony Wimmers at SIMS. So what we're looking at here, uh, this is actually another Himawari example, but we have this running from six, GO-16 and GO-17 as well. On the left and middle panels is just a water vapor band. This is the 6.2 band 8 by itself. And on the right is a high pass filter of that product. You can think of that as basically calculating gradients of the brightness temperatures themselves. And what it does is it really enhances the gradients, in this case, showing these gravity wave features. It's a very subtle gravity wave feature that shows up as these ripples. It shows up better in the high pass filter. And then you can see as the aircraft passes through, they did have some reports of severe turbulence. Uh, in this area corresponding with those ripples. So this is just to kind of give you an idea of how we can use satellite data to help uh, find the turbulence in, in clear sky regions. Uh, so this is the way, the, this is what the product looked like itself looks like. And this is actually from yesterday, um, interestingly. So we have a very recent example. 
Um, and what's plotted is the probability of moderate or greater turbulence. That's the contours. So you can see yellow contour represents 50% probability and the, the other contours are just lower percentage of probability. And then plotted on top of that are the pyreps showing quite a few moderate or moderate turbulence. There's even a, a, a couple of uh, extreme turbulence cases there in Kentucky corresponding with this, uh, this system that was over the, the, south, the southeast United States yesterday. So um, there's a lot more info about this product at this website. If you you could probably just find it by Googling turbulence and Sims, but it does run in real time and I encourage you to take a look at it if you think it might be of interest. Oh, I should also say this is specifically in the 36 to 37,000 uh, flight level. So uh, it is uh, vertically dependent on, um, or the product does have different vertical levels. And then the final experimental product I wanted to highlight is uh, vertical cross sections across flight paths. So this is an example from Atlanta to Chicago. And on the y on the X axis, you see Atlanta over here. We see O'Hare on the far right. Um, and then on the vertical axis is height in, in thousands of feet. And the main thing that we wanted to highlight here are clouds, because this is not something that you can normally get easily since a uh, satellite normally gives you two dimensional info. This is actually giving us three dimensional info of where the clouds are. So you can see on the first half of the flight path, we had uh, high clouds indicated in the white and the blue hatching represents possibly mixed phase. So icing could be a potential issue there. Down here is blue showing some low clouds in the area. This is hard to do because we really can't see through the clouds with GOES 16 and GOES 17 only in some cases. So we may be missing some, some lower clouds down here below the high clouds, but they do a pretty good job of making that estimate, especially when the top layer is semi-transparent. Also plotted on here are the turbulence reports uh, from yesterday, probably in that same area that I highlighted on the, on the last case there over uh, Kentucky, Indiana, etc. So I'll finish by just providing some resources on the web. If you're just looking for imagery and products itself, uh, the slider side is nice. If you just uh, Google Rambi slider or you can copy this URL. Um, another imagery site viewer is from the star group in Nesdis. That's th I th this would load faster if you have low bandwidth. Uh, I didn't say much about volcanoes, but certainly you, you are probably familiar with Volcat from Mike Pavilonis' team up at Sims website there. And here again are the links to the two examples that I showed you, the automated turbulence detection from Sims and the vertical cross section page, which is very experimental, very early at this point. Um, if anybody has any positive or negative feedback on any of these products, really, I, I'd love to hear it. You can, we can talk about it later during the discussion, or you can shoot me an email there at that address. So I'll stop there and pass it to the next panelist. Thanks so much, uh, Dan. Um, very interesting stuff. So um, next uh, we have um, Dr. Heather Reeves, and she is the Assistant Director for the Quattro Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather uh, Research and Operations uh, in Norman, Oklahoma. Within SCIWRO, she leads a team of scientists who are developing new decision support tools for surface transportation and aviation. So welcome. Great, thank you. Am I supposed to share my screen or is somebody else going to? Um, either, either way, I can do it or you can share it. What would you okay. prefer? Um, I'm not sure how to do it. Okay, I'll, I'll take no, care of it for sorry. you. Yeah. No, no, no worries. It's not giving me the option. So. Heather, that's the first time I've ever heard you say, I don't know how to do something. Yeah, so just, <laughs> you haven't been around me very much, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so comfortable with that phrase that doesn't embarrass me a bit to admit it. And you have the uh, MRMS slide? Yeah. Correct? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so while that's coming up, um, I'll tell you that um, one of the things that we work on in my team is this thing called MRMS. It's a data fusion system that integrates together radar, satellite data, lightning, et cetera, et cetera, to create um, decision support tools for weather. Among the things that we create are the usual cast of suspects that you're all familiar with, things like composite reflectivity, echo top and vil. But in actuality, we have over a hundred products and derivatives being produced by MRMS um, operationally and then even more in our experimental system. Next slide, please. 
Uh, next slide, please. It takes a few seconds for it to. Um, okay. oh, well, it, delay. Then, it, then it's given, but that's okay. okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we have three different teams working on MRMS. There's a team focused on severe weather applications, one focused on hydrologic applications, and then there's my team, which does transportation. And the transport team were divided into two different um, line items. One is on surface transportation, and the other focuses on aviation. And so today, what I'm going to talk to you is how we can. Um, uh, meld together these different um, lines of research. So this one is a mashup between aviation and road weather, the two things that I lead. We have a project with um, the Weather Prediction Center out of NSEP to develop a suite of road hazards tools. And this includes things like surface precipitation diagnostics, the probability of whether roads are sub-freezing, things like the snow rate at the surface. When you get above one inch an hour, DOTs can't keep up anymore. The snow plows just can't keep up with that. And these are all being mashed together into one product, a road hazards product. This is still highly um, under development, but um, you see the point here is that we're diagnosing what the road conditions are like, whether they're snowy, whether it's rapidly accumulating snow, icy, or just wet roads. And this is one thing I've often thought could be useful for aviation applications, um, not just for general maintenance and making sure you have the right number of crew available to keep the property cleared, but also for safety, This, as this picture um, suggests, it can sometimes be a problem. Next slide, please. The next mash, I, I'm, I'm still not seeing it. I don't know if anybody else is. No, for me, oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, the next one is with hydrometeorology. So um, there's this algorithm that was developed for the WSR88Ds. Um, it's called the hydrometeor classification algorithm. And that was developed to improve our quantitative precipitation estimation by the 88Ds. Well, we took that algorithm because it does diagnose hail and grapple. We took it and modified it to work with our 3D mosaics for reflectivity in the dual pole moments to see if we could diagnose hail at flight level. And if there's anybody here from American Airlines, I'm sorry. I know you must be about sick of people bringing up this, um, this particular case, but it is the one in situ observation I have that I know where it happened and when it happened and at what altitude. Um, the first image on the from the left of the, of the MRMS output shows reflectivity in the diagnoses of grapple and hail from that algorithm. And we did have hail at flight level right where the plane plowed into that storm. And it wasn't just there like in the minutes before, it didn't just appear, it was there 10 minutes prior. And if you go one more over for me, it was there even 20 minutes prior. So the next slide shows it at 20 minutes prior. So we think there's um, application here for now casting that could be really helpful and useful um, going forward. Next slide, please. Yep, there it is at 20 minutes prior, that black blob. Um, next slide after that, please. So um, this is now a severe weather mashup with aviation. Um, this is something that we um, were inspired to work on with the Aviation Weather Center. So we all know about convective sigmets and what they look like, um, the, um, the whole design of them and everything. Uh, I did some research on when were the first convective sigmets um, made or what, what inspired them. And the accident that caused the convective sigmets happened in 1977. So I don't know for sure when sigmets actually started after that, but we'll just assume shortly after that. So if you go to the next slide, please. We are now closing in on the 50th anniversary of the first sigmet. So I think it's very exciting news, but this is the big question. Look at the sigmets. They're still hand-drawn vertex by vertex, by human, one by one, updating sometimes 20 an hour. They still are disseminated using the same kind of formatting that we would use if we were using a DIFAX machine. And so I have to ask the question that, that just went away from the previous slide, which is this, when sigmets, can we go back a slide, please? When sigmets turn 50 in a few years from now, is this what we still want them to look like? Do we still want to have some human being manually 
sweating away drawing these things and do we still want to disseminate them as though we're still using DIFAX machines or do we want some kind of innovation? I think you know, that's a big question for me. We're coming up on 50 years. It'd be nice if something, um, some new technology and capabilities were folded in. And so now we can move to the next slide, please. So um, we've developed software to automatically detect convective sigma. And so on the left is what the human forecasters from the AWC produced, and on the right is what we've produced with our software. It's not a one-to-one -one agreement. We've got a sigma off the coast of South Carolina, and they don't, and they have one over South Georgia, and we don't. But having some software like this can help relieve the workload on the human forecaster. They can pay more attention to these marginal type situations where it's sort of is it or isn't it type of a segment while letting the easy wins just pass through and be automatically produced and just sort of rubber stamp them. Once you get the computers involved, you can do a lot more. Can you please move on to the next slide? So this is one thing that we've been playing with, which is grading the sigmets according to coverage. So I've just put different coverage thresholds in here. When we do this, now we have a product that's in lockstep with what the TCF does. And this gives us a great and new way to validate something like the TCF. We no longer need to validate the TCF using the point observations from the radar to the objects produced by the people. We can actually do object-based verification. And this would allow us to um, uncover whether or not there's certain pathological problems with the TCF, such as its size, the size of the polygons, or maybe their position might be, you know, skewed at certain times of day relative to where the convection actually happens. So I think there's a lot to be done here. I think I might have one more slide after this. Ah, this is it. Yeah. And that is to, um, there's no reason why we have to limit ourselves to just a 2D depiction. Convection does tend to taper off as you go up. And so it may not penetrate to the level where you want to fly. It may not be as much of a problem up there. And so we thought, why not grade it and then have it be height dependent, that grading of coverage. So here from 25 to 30,000 feet, the coverage is not nearly so bad as it is in the worst part of the atmosphere. So these are just all just some different ideas that I have for what we could do to mash up these different um, areas of expertise that we have at NSSL with something that might be useful for aviation. I hope it was interesting for you. And thanks so much for the opportunity to share.